we'll, may, we'll wait maybe another, another minute uh, to introduce uh, the speaker today. But while I wait, uh, welcome everyone and thank you for being here. I hope you all had a wonderful Halloween uh, with a lot of treats and not so many tricks. Um, we definitely had that kind of Halloween here at home with two little kids. Um, of course, like Boulder weather decided to change dramatically just yesterday. We had like beautiful weather till Saturday. And then of course it was a, a cold Halloween, but you know, nothing that you could not beat with a few extra layers. Um, anyway, so welcome to today's uh, colloquium. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Enrique Lopez uh, Rodriguez, a uh, great astronomer and actually a close friend of mine. He was born uh, in the Canary Islands, which are, you know, currently famous because they're volcanically active uh, these days, if you've been following uh, the news. But in astronomy circles, they're also very famous because of the quality of their night sky and the quality of their observatories. Um, you know, two main reasons that made a young Enrique fell in love with astronomy and uh, made him commit to, to a career that we all uh, share and love here uh, at CU. Um, you know, he did his studies in the Canary Islands and went, uh, you know, across the pond to the University of Florida where he got uh, his PhD. While at the University of Florida, he actually held a position uh, in the Netherlands at the University of Utrecht. Uh, his work is mainly in extragalactic uh, areas. Uh, he's got a lot of expertise in polarimetry and uh, looking at AGNs uh, and so forth. After he graduated from the University of Florida, he held positions in San Antonio and also in Austin. Actually, the first position that he got, he drove his motorbike from the University of Florida uh, to Texas. Uh, he moved on a motorbike and a small um, backpack. That's, you know, that's what we accrue when we're graduate students. So not much stuff uh, for us at that time. I will also say that we were roommates during college. We share actually something that a lot of our friends label as a glorified camping kind of um, house, but it was a home to us. So anyway. Uh, after, after his uh, tenure in Texas, he moved to Sofia, uh, where he ended up being the instrument scientist for Hawk. Uh, he's actually brought that instrument uh, to new levels. Um, you know, work that he's done with Hawk made it into the cover of, of Nature Astronomy. And he's been recently also featured as a plenary speaker in the, in the AAS meeting. Most recently, he has moved to Stanford, where, you know, he keeps pushing uh, his work uh, in trying to understand uh, magnetic fields uh, in, uh, in galaxies. And we, he's gonna be talking about that today to all of us. So without further ado, Enrique, uh, you know, the Zoom room is, is yours. Awesome. <laughs> thank you, Jorge, for the warm uh, introduction. And thank you so much for the invitation to talk uh, about uh, the recent um, results on stochastic um, magnetism using far infrared uh, polarimetry. Um, here, what I want to show, uh, yes, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is like, I'm gonna take you to a tour uh, through different galactic environments uh, to, show, to show you how integral the magnetic fields are in galaxy evolution, which is something that usually not taken into account when the people are talking and modeling about the evolution of galaxies and the formation of galaxies. So if you do like a very, uh, quick search in even in, in Google uh, about galactic uh, magnetic fields, you will find that most of our knowledge in this field arises from several decades uh, using radio polarimetric observations, which actually trace the magnetic fields in the diffuse regions of, uh, of galaxies uh, by tracing synchrotron emission of high energetic particles. Here, what I want to show is the new window of exploration that Sophia has opened uh, to understand the stochastic magnetic fields by doing what only Hawk Plus, uh, the far infrared polarimetry, can do, which is measuring the magnetic fields in the densest region of galaxies. So now, what uh, what I'm what I'm doing is 
combining these two wavelength ranges uh, that actually give us a unique access of the magnetic field across the multiphase uh, interstellar medium. Um, so now what we have is a complete, pic uh, complete uh, picture of galaxy evolution from a uh, hydromagnetic framework. So first of all, uh, let me um, introduce the simulation by Illustris 3 and, uh, TNG and that where we can see galaxies evolving over time. So here we see a vast diversity of star formation histories for individual galaxies, where the stellar mass density of galaxies rapidly increase at ratio one, two, three, with about half of the stellar mass uh, formed by ratio uh, uh, around equal one or two. So therefore galaxy formation can happen a number of ways. So you have in situ star formation in a collapsed galaxy, you have major and minor mergers, uh, and also gas accretion on, uh, from the intergalactic uh, medium. This is the, all the combination that you are seeing there in the optical uh, light, where you see the uh, filamentary structures and the beginning of the universe uh, collapse into forming uh, clusters and uh, higher uh, mass uh, galaxies. However, this is only part of the picture of galaxy evolution across cosmic time. The full picture of galaxy evolution is driven by the interplay of gravity, dark matter, feedback, turbulence, and magnetic fields. The least, but not the, the last. So this I use this TNG also provide a simulation on how the magnetic fields have been amplified across cosmic time. So the big field is amplified as a consequence of two things. One is the galaxy formation, and the other one, the most important one, is the turbulence driving dynamos, where dynamo is just the conversion of kinetic energy into magnetic energy. Um, so we think that seed magnetic fields were generated by anisotropies and inhomogeneities in the hot plasma, the early stage of the universe. You have a, a we think that is 10 to the minus uh, 20 um, Gauss. And then what you have uh, is an amplification of the magnetic field onto these micro gauss that we have now. And that happened during the violent feedback dominated phase of galaxy formation history at around C212 to, to 3, where these seed magnetic fields were amplified by small scale dynamos, driving by accretion onto supermassive black holes, by majors, by also galactic outflows, and or supernova explosions. So what you have is like after this um, peak, you have a subsequence of quiescent galaxy evolution phase where this um, amplified magnetic field is being maintained uh, by differential rotation in galaxies and supernova explosions. The differential rotation is the alpha omega uh, mechanism that we all know. So what you can see that at any given time of, um, of the time of the universe, the magnetic fields are amplified. So then it can be uh, some uh, specific uh, moments and places in, in galaxy evolution this magnetic field can be in close equipartition with thermal and turbulent forces. And this is where the cases where magnetic field can influence the galaxy evolution. So you can see that this scenario raises the question of the origin evolution of magnetic fields in galaxy formation. Um, so we live in an empirical universe. So what do we know about uh, magnetic fields in galaxies? So as I said at the beginning, it comes from a few decades of uh, uh, using radio parametric observations. And here I show the typical magnetic field for example, for spiral galaxies. We know that they are uh, order, large scale magnetic field tightly following the spiral uh, arms uh, seen in the, in the optical. Uh, these um, large, scale, large scale magnetic field are the contribution of order and turbulent uh, magnetic fields in the spiral arms. Once you tilt, these uh, uh, galaxies, and you see in the H on, which is the top right, you see that the magnetic field is not only in the this of the galaxy, but also in the halo. And you have this typical X-shaped structure uh, as an underlying feature of spiral galaxies, which extend to several kiloparsecs scale into the halo. Um, these uh, magnetic fields, when you go to the regular galaxies or interacting galaxies, the magnetic field became more uh, messy and more complicated. You have, for example, in the regular galaxies, a combination of uh, radial fields, a uh, spiral fields, giving you some hint of the alpha omega uh, dynamo. And then when you go to interacting galaxies, you see that the magnetic field actually 
uh, follow the tidal um, effects uh, of the interaction of the of the galaxy. With actually, you see an increase of the magnetic field um, due to the the merger, uh, which is um, aligned with the um, compression along the the tidal fronts. So this. Um, Observations uh, has opened a few questions uh, in galaxy evolution uh, for the role of magnetic field. So one of them is how did the evolution in galaxies emerge and affect the magnetic field? Uh, is the single galactic medium magnetized and how it got magnetized? Um, how has the magnetic field been amplified by interaction of galaxies or also by star formation in within the, the galaxies? And finally, where the structure of magnetic field around uh, Arctic uh, nuclei and, how, uh, and also how Arctic galactic nuclei affect the magnetic field on the host galaxy. So, um, in order to study these uh, magnetic fields, we use parametric techniques, which is the study of the different components of the electromagnetic radiation. Uh, however, uh, not all wavelengths provide information about the, the magnetic fields, sadly. So here, what I show is a cartoon representation of the wavelength um, as a function of the several polarization uh, mechanism. So you can see that um, a lot of efforts uh, have been performed at the optical and near infrared uh, in, the, in the left of the, of the panel. However, this wavelength regime is mainly dominated by dust and electroscattering in external galaxies, which is this uh, orange um, a power law uh, line in the in the top left. So these uh, observations in the optical and infrared have been done since um, several decades uh, ago. Here, what I show is the uh, observations uh, in the optical uh, and near infrared of M51. So you can see that the um, the, the black lines represent the uh, polarization uh, orientation. However. In the optical, what you see is a, is a azimuthal, like almost centrosymmetric uh, polarization pattern around the core, uh, which is actually a characteristic of the dust scattering, uh, where the orientation of the position angle of polarization is perpendicular to the last direction of flight of the radiation. So you have the core emitting radiation going around the, the disk and then coming into our line of sight. So the position angle is basically perpendicular. So it, it's going to create a centrosymmetric pattern. Um, so we cannot know anything about the magnetic field in this case because it's just scattering. So uh, Pavel and, and Dan Clements did a uh, actually heroic uh, observation in the near infrared of M51, really deep observations, uh, very nice analysis uh, in order to get the signature of magnetically aligned dust grains. However, the degree of polarization that you find there is very, very low. So you see that it's uh, below 2.05%. And that is actually the red tail of the dust scattering that is showing in the, in the plot. So it's no signature of magnetic aligned dust grain. So optical and near infrared sadly doesn't tell you anything about the magnetic field in standard galaxies, at least for M51. So as I mentioned at the beginning, so all the, the work has been done was in radio observations. The physics behind that is like we're tracing cosmic ray particles illuminated by magnetic fields in the diffuse um, ISM of the galaxy, which emit uh, synchrotron radiation. So then um, Ranier, uh, Deck and company found the magnetic fields are found to be along the, the spider arms of the galaxy with a maximum of polarization in the diffuse ISM, which is called spatial with the interarms arms of the galaxy. So what are we bringing new here? So here our approach is to estimate the magnetic field at the peak of the thermal emission in molecular clouds and star forming regions of nearby galaxies. So what we are tracing is the signature of magnetically aligned dust grains uh, in the midplane of the of the galaxy without any contribution of the diffuse um, um, ISM. So what we do here is using the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, SOFIA, uh, with the newest um, instrument, which is Hawk Plus, the uh, High Resolution Airband uh, Weightband Camera Plus. And what we do is a series of imaging parametric uh, observation to trace the dust continuum uh, in, uh, yeah, in polarized flux from 50 to 214 microns. So, and you can see there that we have four different bands from 53, 89, 154, and 214 microns, tracing the peak of a star uh, forming regions uh, in, in nearby galaxies. 
Um, the physics behind that is, uh, is using multiple aligned screens. So let me briefly uh, summarize this uh, topic. So what we have is dust grains co-spatial with molecular clouds and star forming regions. So these uh, dust grains absorb anisotropic radiation from the interstellar medium. And then the, has, the dust is heated at uh, 20 to 100 uh, microns with peaks at fine infrared and submillimeter wavelength. So what happened here is that the starlight transferred angular momentum to the dust grains. So then because the dust grains are not spherical, they absorb more light in one axis than another and the dust grains uh, end up spinning around the axis of greatest moment of inertia, which is the short axis. So in addition, we know that most of the dust grains are paramagnetic. So the endematic moment of inertia is also generated, which is parallel to the spin, uh, spin axis. So due to the magnetic moment, and because the ISM has a, a local uh, magnetic field, the dust grains end up processing along the orientation of the local magnetic field where the final configuration is given by the long axis of the dust grain to be perpendicular to orientation of the local field, which is what uh, you see here. This uh, new is going to be parallel to the magnetic field orientation in the, in the local ISM. Um, so then due to differential extinction, you have two different ways to estimate the magnetic field strength, the magnetic field orientation. One is an optical and near infrared wavelength the polarized uh, extinction has a position angle of polarization parallel to the uh, magnetic field uh, orientation. And in far infrared and submillimeter, the polarized emission has a position angle of polarization perpendicular to the magnetic field orientation. And this is exactly the signature that we are detecting with, uh, with Sophia. So the observed position angle of polarization then will be rotated by 90 degrees to obtain the orientation of the local magnetic field uh, in nearby galaxies. Um, this approach has also another advantage. So as I say, radio parametric observation traces the magnetic field in the diffuse ISM. These observations suffer of uh, Faraday rotation due to the electron column density and tangle be filled along the line of sight. So what you have is like in radio, radio observation trace the magnetic field at galactic scales, heights of one to two kiloparsec. So the observed B field will be two things. One is the average of the multiple B fields and the electron column density in the, uh, of the diffuse ISM around the light of side in the halo and in the mid plane. And also that magnetic field will be rotated and depolarized because of Faraday rotation through the magnetic field in the, and the electron uh, medium in the halo and the, and the mid plane of the galaxy. So you have to correct that in order to, to get intrinsic polarization in the um, in the galaxy. So for the far infrared observations, uh, those here that I show in, in Hawk Plus, uh, this is the same galaxy. So this is NGC A91 in radio in the left and far infrared in, on, on the right. Uh, you see that the uh, polarization um, pseudo vectors, in this case, showing the magnetic field orientation are co-spatial with the molecular clouds and star forming regions uh, in the mid plane of the galaxy. So far infrared observation do not suffer from far rotation and thus an electron scattering mechanism are negligible at these uh, wavelengths. So therefore the far infrared parameter observation trace the magnetic field in the mid plane of the galaxy uh, with a vertical high uh, lower than 500 uh, parsec with a contamination from the, from the halo. So, and this is one of the, the main uh, new uh, things that bring into um, to star galactic uh, magnetic uh, field. So in our case, what we have is uh, 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 recently accepted since uh, a year ago, uh, Sophia Legacy Program um, uh, that aims to construct the first comprehensive empirical picture of the magnetic fields in the multi-phase ISM as a function of the gas dynamics and gas uh, types from 100 to kiloparsec scale by combining the radio polarization observation, far infrared observation, and gas tracers of the molecular uh, gas and the neutral gas. The idea is to uh, study how the central uh, AGM modify the magnetic field in the host galaxy, uh, we also want to study how star forming regions affect amplification and morphology of the galactic uh, magnetic fields. Um, 
we want to provide a sample of more or less uh, 15 spider galaxies, uh, face on and a little bit uh, inclined at up to 40 or, or 45 degrees uh, that can be used to constrain uh, galactic uh, dynamo theories. Uh, we want to explore how galaxy mergers at uh, different stages affect the amplification of the field. So we have a several interacting galaxies too. And we want to provide measurements of the strength and structural hematic field to study the production of high energy particles from starburst uh, galaxies. So for the record, so don't go and check all this uh, uh, table, just to say that all galaxies that we have, we have a sample of 20 galaxies, have available radio parametric observation, molecular and neutral gas maps, and Herschel observations. As you can see, it's a combination of spiral galaxies interacting and AGN. It's a flux limit um, a galaxy, a galaxy sample. Uh, this is basically 80% or 90% of the galaxies that you can observe with, uh, with Hawk Plus uh, due to the, the limitation of our sensitivity. Uh, the blue rows are the galaxies that we have already uh, in hand observed with, uh, with Hawk Plus in the past, uh, in the past year. Um, where all data is available since the day one of observation. You can get the, the data full reduced, ready to, to perform science in the SOFIA archive, uh, you can see in the, at the bottom. And what we are doing here uh, for the legacy program is to produce high level data products, uh, not only for the SOFIA observation, but also for the complementary su uh, supporting data. And you can get all this data in our website in galmacfields.com. Uh, uh, the, all the data, all the high-level products will come out as uh, the papers uh, are published. So, and of course, this is impossible with this amazing team of uh, international group of experts uh, in stochastic magnetism, infrared and radioparametric observations, and theories and MHD model modelers. So, as I say, this is a combined um, uh, Sophia legacy program between uh, Suyan Mao and the uh, Max Planck. Um, for Radio Astronomy uh, Institute uh, and Bond, which has the expertise in radio parametric observation from like decades. And then our case here in the US are mainly focused in the infrared uh, and molecular um, gas uh, tracers of, of galaxies. But the combination is a unique uh, combination of tracing the magnetic field in the multi-phase ISM. So without further ado, so let's now and um, diving into this recent, recent uh, observation on results. So I would like to start with uh, NGC 1068. This is a grand design spiral galaxy hosting uh, obscure uh, galactic uh, nucleus and the, the core. Um, unfortunately, radio parametric observation on the host galaxy does not exist, but exists of the, of the center in the, in the AGN, but no a uh, kiloparsec scale. So the picture that you see here on the, on the right, is the, for the first time, is the galactic magnetic fields uh, in the spiral galaxy of, of 1068 uh, by means of magnetic aligned dust grains using Hawk Plus at 89 uh, microns. So from now on, what I'm going to do is like I'm going to show beautiful pictures, but then I'm going to show the, the parametric uh, measurements, which is what, how we do the science behind that. But the streamlines show a representation, a visual representation of the magnetic field observed with Hawk. And the color scale in the background is a combination of um, optical X-ray and H alpha um, images. And you can see the most prominent feature is the large scale B field tightly aligned with the molecular spider arms of the galaxy at scales of three to four kiloparsec. Um, when we look at the data, uh, what we have here is on the left is uh, the, the black lines represent the magnetic field uh, orientation, the measurements at 89 microns with, with Hawk. And if you do the simultal uh, profile, which is the, the plots on the, on the right of the degree of polarization on the top and the position angle on the, on the bottom, you see a sinusoidal um, variation of the degree of polarization and position angle polarization a function or as a function of the simultal angle, which is actually a characteristic of the spiral field with a pitch angle at a given inclination. So what we did was to fit a very simplistic two-dimensional large scale regular magnetic field um, which I show in the, 
a color scale uh, as a streamlines on the on the left side and you can see that the model uh, really well represents the so can can explain the simultal uh, profile with a pitch angle uh, magnetic pitch angle of 70, 17 degrees uh, with a galaxy incline at 48 degrees which is uh, the inclination is uh, compatible with previous uh, uh, gas tracer observations and the pitch angle is pretty similar to the optical uh, op optical observations of the of the spider uh, arms. So one important detail here that I'm gonna go and come back a uh, later on is that these results does not imply that it's a unique B field of a single line of this size in the, in the galaxy. I mean, that's, that's not physically correct. So what happened here is that you have the average magnetic field orientation within the beam of the observations, which in this case is 500 per sec, has a preferential orientation from beam to beam that's consistent with a large scale order B field at a scale of three kilo per sec. So what you have is uh, on the right is a, a cartoon representation of, a, of the angular resolution of our observation in red, and you have some shape of the magnetic field um, in within the beam. So the multiple loops that the magnetic field perform within the beam has a preferential orientation along the spire arms. Uh, and this is what we call an isotropic uh, turbulent field. So at least in the spider arms, when you go from beams of 500 per sec to 500 per sec, the average B field at five, uh, three to four kilo per sec is consistent with a large scale uh, B field. What happened with it, those uh, 500 uh, per sec? We, I mean, for sure you have some uh, turbulence uh, due to star formation regions um, or things inside of that, uh, of that beam. Um, interestingly, what we found uh, within the center two kiloparsecs is even uh, more interesting. So what you have is, in this case, it's a zero uh, polarization regions that are co-located with the region of high star formation regions in the galaxy. And this is exactly where the contact points of the star of the spider arms with the uh, inner bar in the, in the galaxy. So what we have here is that you have an increase of velocity dispersion and tangled magnetic fields due to the star formation regions, which what we call uh, isotropic uh, magnetic field uh, right in the edges of the, of the inner bar of the galaxy. So when you go to the inner bar, uh, the magnetic field is parallel, parallel to the inner bar of the galaxy. So our model, which is a spiral B field, of course, can explain this feature. However, we suggest that this B field has been compressed in the inner bar, moving uh, material inward toward the AGN. So what you have here is that the galactic bar creates a non asymmetric perturbation of the gravitational potential of the galaxy, which is remove angular momentum from the gas, allowing the, ga the gas flowing inwards toward the, the AGN. So what is happening here is that the galactic bar generates uh, shearing gas flows that, is, that stretch and amplify the B-field, which makes the B-field dynamically important in galactic bars and allowing the, the gas flow and following the, the, um, the gas uh, towards the, the AGN and perhaps feeding the, the AGN too. Um, so and this is what we call the compressed and turbulent B-field in the inner bar. So right on the center, we have the Arctic nuclei and itself is unpolarized. So this is like almost a 0% of polarization, but I mean, this is 500 per sec uh, beam. So it can be a, um, a combination of many things. You have extinction, multi-component velocities and tangled B fields in this case. So we cannot say anything about the AGN in this case. Um, so in summary, what we have is like we discover the first large scale uh, or the B field by means of magnetic aligned transgression of the galaxy. And we found that the star formation regions, the inner bar and the central AGN uh, modify this large scale B field due to turbulent, uh, uh, turbulence at uh, small scales, where small scales is a few uh, hundred per sec. So this is the, the pretty picture of a spiral galaxy, easy to understand. So now what I'm gonna go is like a little bit more, uh, I'm gonna 
uh, get a little bit more complicated in this picture of, of galaxy evolution in terms of interaction. So what we did afterwards is to investigate another grand design spiral galaxy, M51, but this one has is interacting with a companion uh, galaxy, M51b in the north. Uh, the beautiful thing of this galaxy like, has been extensively observed in radio parametric observations that I show on the, on the right. And you can see again, the streamlines show a very beautiful large scale order field uh, all the way from the core to the outer parts of the, of the galaxy uh, around seven uh, kiloparsec that follows the spiral arms and inter arms of the galaxy. So our results, the new ones are on the left, uh, which show the same color scale, but the streamlines represent the measured magnetic field using Sophia, the far infrared observations and 154 microns. And you can see just by very quick visual that the magnetic field in the outer scale of the galaxy uh, in radio and far infrared is not the same. So, but let's go and quantify this. So what I show here is on the, so I show on the left is the magnetic field uh, orientation uh, of Hawk plus 154 microns on the top, uh, three centimeters and radio in the middle and six centimeters on the, on the bottom. Uh, and then on the right, I show a, a, a plot that show the magnetic field pitch angle as a function of the, of the radius from the center of the galaxy. And you can see that when you take into account the full disk and you don't separate between inter arms and arms, the pitch angle of the far infrared and radio, which is tracing the dense ISM and the diffuse ISM are the same. However, we have enough spatial resolution to resolve the, to separate the arms and inter arms. And in this, in this case, when you only study the inter arms, which is pure diffuse ISM, you don't have transformation regions, the pitch angle of the far infrared and radio are, are the same. So this implies that the dense ISM and the diffuse ISM, at least in the interarms, uh, are, uh, are trace the same um, B field. However, things get a little bit more interesting when you separate the, the arms of the galaxy. So in this case, uh, I, we separate the arms, uh, the north uh, arm in the, uh, the one is the, yeah, on the north, and then you have the south uh, arm that connect with M51b. And interestingly, differences show up when uh, in the outer skis of the, of the galaxy. So you see the pitch angle are more or less the same, up to five kiloparsec. But then the pitch angle of the 154 microns in blue uh, differs, is statistically different than the far infrared uh, and that the radio uh, observations, which is more, more or less constant along the, the whole radio of the, of the galaxy. So when you zoom, so let's zoom in now in these uh, boxes and you see the clearly, clearly the separate, the differences between the 154 microns, which is very messy in the areas of star formation regions and the six and three centimeters, which uh, follow the, the large scale uh, B field. So this is actually the first uh, evidence that synchrotron emission and thermal polarized emission do not trace this so do trace different components of the, of the B field in, in galaxies. Um, and this is very interesting in the context of galactic dynamo theories. So in case of 1068, uh, we observe the B field is consistent with a large scale order B field dominated by differential rotation of the galaxy. So you have the alpha mega mechanism taking place for, for a long time and uh, making the large scale uh, following the dynamics of the, of the galaxy. Uh, so, but the, and this, uh, this effect also apply to M51, but only in the center five kilo per sec of the, of the galaxy. And for the, the dense and diffuse uh, ISM. However, when you go to the outer scale of the galaxy for M51, so what you have is like the results um, show that it's a large angular dispersion from beam to beam. Uh, which are due to an increase of the small scale turbulent field. So you go from dominating large scale B field in the inner parts of the galaxy to a dominating small scale B field in the outer part of the galaxy. So um, in this case, what you have is like the observed B field 
uh, in the outer scale of the galaxy is a, is a effect of the star formation regions and or galaxy uh, interaction, which both of them we cannot um, distinguish in this, uh, in this case. So in order to um, study the effect of the galaxy interaction, what I did was to observe uh, another uh, galaxy. In this case, uh, it's a galaxy in interaction, uh, Centaurus A. So this galaxy is thought to be the remnant of a merger between a elliptical and a spiral galaxy. So it gives us what happened to a magnetic field after the interaction have taken place and you have this merge uh, already uh, in action. Um, so Centaurus A, uh, in optical, you see that it's elliptical galaxy divided by uh, at the mid plane by the dust lane of the spiral uh, galaxy. At infrared, the inner part of the dust lane is observed to show this parallelogram shape, which uh, Ali, Alice uh, Kijen and company using velocity fields of server tracers describe this uh, parallelogram shape as the structure of a warp disk that is seen almost in H on view. So the aim of this study is to, the study that I want to do with, that I did with, with Hawk was to observe the magnetic fields in this structure and study the effect of the merger in the B field. And what I found, I mean, is really, really fascinating. So what you have is a magnetic field that is tightly following the warp disk at the scale of three kiloparsec. So here uh, uh, again, so I show the streamlines of the magnetic field and you have the combination of the optical, uh, B field, uh, optical images, radio uh, observation showing the, the radio jet because it has a very powerful AGM and the far infrared uh, and the infrared observation showing the parallelogram. So just to show the, the measurements. So the black lines represent the B field orientation uh, with a Hawk plus uh, 89 microns, and you see that and the north and south are tightly following the, the warp uh, disk. And in the center is a little bit messy because you have the orientation, you have the contribution of the GN and you have a bubble uh, due to perhaps a, a shock uh, of the GN with the host galaxy. So following the same recipe of 1060N and 51. So in this case, what I did was to uh, try to explain the observed magnetic field using a three-dimensional large scale regular field uh, that I show here are three different um, projections. So this is the best uh, model uh, fitting the observation of Centaurus A. So face on a model, you see this um, uh, spider uh, structure. And when it's projected uh, to the inclination orientation of Centaurus A, you see a large scale B field with a jet uh, perpendicular direction to the, to the disk uh, of the galaxy. Interestingly, this model like, reproduced very well the optical observations uh, in this case. So the optical observation in this case, because you have a dust lane that is highly obscure with, 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 yeah, with dust. So the optical observations are dominated by the uh, absorption, by medical aligned dust grains. And you see that the B field lines in the optical are very uh, coherent, which is also in, in the model. However, when you compare the far infrared observations, in this case, uh, in blue lines, with the best uh, model that I come out uh, trying to fit the far infrared observations, um, that doesn't really uh, explain the far infrared observations uh, of Centaurus A. So you see that the, um, uh, that the absolute angular difference between the model and observation is very low. This is the 3.6 degrees, but you have a very high dispersion of around 23 degrees. And this dispersion is the dispersion between beam to beam that uh, is larger than the observational uncertainties of the polarization degrees of five degrees. So you have actually more dispersion between beam to beam that you can explain by the quality of, of the observation. So this is intrinsic uh, dispersion of the magnetic field from Lyosi to Lyosi across the, the, um, the disk of the galaxy. So in order to do that, uh, to, to study what's going on with the with this dispersion, uh, I separate the galaxy in several parts uh, and then study the physical condition of the ASM for each one of them. So I found that the polarized flux, which I show on the, on the left in the vertical axis versus the total intensity in the horizontal axis, 
can be used to separate the physical component of the galaxy. So the polarized flux seems to drastically drop at two different intensities, which is these are two vertical blue lines um, that actually are separating physically uh, the outer index of the galaxy in black, which is the lowest uh, intensity. In blue is the molecular disk, this warp uh, disk in the far infrared, uh, which is the intermedium uh, intensities. And then you have this region of high intensity, but very low uh, polarization degree, which uh, correspond to region of star formation region and the AGN of the galaxy. So if you follow these uh, three different structures and compare it with different uh, physical parameters of the ISM, you found that you find that the degree of polarization decrease as a function of the dust temperature. Um, so the hotter the medium, the lower polarization is measured. So when you compare with the column density as a, a, a measurement of the optical uh, depth, you see that the denser the medium, uh, the less polarized is the, is the region. And also what you can do is that like you can use the CO emission line using ALMA as a proxy of the turbulence kinetic energy of the molecular gas. And you can see that for each physical region has different turbulent kinetic energy. Specifically, the turbulent kinetic energy increase with increasing temperature and column density. But on the other hand, the polarization decrease in, decreases with all these parameters uh, are increasing. So what you have is like a higher turbulence, higher column density, higher temperature, lower, polar, uh, lower polarization. So, and this, again, you can explain this as um, in terms of the um, galactic uh, dynamo in this case. So you have a higher turbulent uh, dynamo at smaller scales that actually are creating this dispersion of the magnetic field from beam, uh, from beam to beam. So in this case, what you have is uh, an increase of the small scale turbulent field, which arise from the increase of the turbulent kinetic energy in the molecular disk of the, of the galaxy. So these, resho these results were show is a change from the large scale to a small scale dynamo taking, uh, taking action. And you can see that the observed B field is the remnant of the galactic uh, merger. We, what you have is like the B field has no enough time to create this large scale regular B field since their interaction. Um, the important thing here is like this effect may be one of the mechanisms to amplify the magnetic field across cosmic time. So you have this very low magnetic field of 10 to the minus 20, and you have the magnetic field of 10 to the uh, of micro gauss now. Um, you need to have these small scale turbulent um, dynamos uh, taking action across the, the galaxy formation in order to increase the, the B field. And indeed, when you estimate the, the strength of the magnetic field for M51, uh, what I show here on the on the left is the, the map of the magnetic field using radio parametric observation. You actually see that the big field strength is larger in the northern part of the galaxy, which are co-spatial with the region interacting with M51b. And it's also um, uh, co-spatial with the regions where we see that the magnetic field in the dense ISM traced by far infrared observation and in the diffuse ISM traced by radio are not the, the same. So what you have is the interaction uh, affect the magnetic field first in the dense regions of the ISM uh, by, for example, triggering uh, star formation regions or moving the dense uh, ISM, making the dense ISM more turbulent. Um, so just uh, to, to end up uh, today, I'm gonna finish with uh, another way to uh, amplify the magnetic field. And in this case, uh, I would like to finish with the Starburst uh, Galaxy M50, uh, M82. And the idea here is to understand how Starburst may have magnetized the intergalactic medium during the violent feedback dominated phase of the galaxy formation history. So before the mergers can amplify the magnetic field in the galaxy, in this case, it's like how this amplified magnetic field uh, can magnetize the intergalactic medium. So a few years ago, Hawk Plus observed the magnetic field in M MT2, uh, which show here in this, uh, the streamline on the, on the right, uh, show the magnetic field are parallel to the galactic outflow. 
So on the left image show the optical infrared observations of the host galaxy and the H alpha emission across the, the outflow. And I zoom in, correspond to the B field orientation in the central 500 kiloparsecs of the outflow showing the magnetic field along the, the galactic outflow. So what we did uh, this year is go a step further and ask what does the B field look like across the galactic outflow and in the halo? So in order to do that, I need to characterize what are the different components uh, along the, the outflow. And just a, a, a cartoon, for example, we have to estimate the magnetic field geometry and strength. So we need to describe the several components along the outflow. So we know that we have a large scale magnetic field observed by Hawk. So we also know that you have some turbulence on the magnetic field due to the supernova explosion of the starbursts in the galaxy, in the center of the galaxy. Um, what we need to do is like to observe the, so we have the, the observed B field is then the combined large scale and the small scale turbulent magnetic field. So since the fifties, we have a very simplistic way to estimate the magnetic field strength. Uh, so we can use this uh, davis chandrasekhar Karfami method, which relates the density of the medium, the, which is the rho parameter, the velocity dispersion of the gas, this is sigma v, and the angular dispersion of the observed uh, position of polarization sigma phi. However, we have a really, really, really big problem here to estimate the, the magnetic field strength. And the problem is that, that we have a large scale flow uh, across the outflow that stretch the B field, which decrease the turbulence along the, uh, the outflow. So if you want to estimate, if you want to use the davis chandrasekhar Chandra Fermi method, you can't at all because the B field is being stretched by this large scale flow. So what we did is to modify the classical DCF method by taking into account the large scale uh, flow. In this case, what we did was to resolve the idea MHT equations. In this case, using two different velocity waves. So you have the alpha wave, and then you have the large scale flow, which is the, the gas flow on the, um, uh, in the outflow. And you end up with a correction of the DSF method by taking into account the contribution of the large scale flow. So here, what you have is the correction, the D prime uh, is equal to the, the classical DCF method, but you have this factor of one to the minus uh, this factor U, where the U is the velocity, um, uh, the yeah, velocity field of the large scale flow. So if you don't have large scale flow, the, the B prime, the correction is equal to the, to the classical BCF method. But if you have a large scale flow dominating, so then the DCF method overestimate the magnetic field strength. And this is normal because what you have is a stretching of the magnetic field. So you are decreasing the turbulence. And so that means that you are decreasing the magnetic field uh, strength. Um, so basically by simply by having the information about velocity component of the large scale flow, you can estimate the magnetic field uh, strength. And we do it in a, in a point by point base. And then we estimate the, a 2D map of the turbulent magnetic field strength uh, that has an average of uh, 0.3 uh, milligauss in the central kiloparsec with a peak, of, um, uh, a peak of magnetic field strength in the center of the star forming region of a one uh, milligauss more or less. Interestingly, because you have the metric field strength, you can now uh, estimate the relationship between the kinetic thermal and magnetic energy in the outflow by estimating the defined beta prime parameter. Uh, and then what you end up is that the turbulent kinetic and magnetic energy are in clocks close equipartition up to two kiloparsec uh, above and below the starburst uh, core. So here what you see is that the energy radial profiles as a function of the radius. And you see that the thermal uh, with the hydrostatic uh, energy is, uh, is almost half an order of magnitude lower than the kinetic and the magnetic field uh, strength which are in equipartition. The most interesting part of this project was the combination, uh, the collaborative work between solar physicists and stellar galactic astronomer. So what we did like for the first time, we used the potential field extrapolation commonly used in solar physics. Uh, this potential field extrapolation derived the B field lines above the corona to study if the B field are open into the interplanetary medium or look back into the solar 
uh, surface. Uh, to do doing this, so what uh, we found is that the magnetic field in M82 are uh, open, and what you have is like using the observed B field from the center two kiloparsec. We are now able to describe the B field up to ten kiloparsec scales when into the intergalactic medium. So what you have is like the one mega uh, milli uh, Gauss central B field. Uh, becomes several micro, several micro Gauss at 10 kiloparsec from the from the galaxy. So in this case, so you have the galaxy outflow uh, dominates all over uh, into the galactic medium. So the magnetic field, this large scale magnetic field, cannot feed back the the AGN, the, the sorry, the starburst, but uh, enrich the intergalactic medium with um, uh, with uh, a magnetic fields. In this case, this is a sketch uh, that I show. So the outflow help to premate the intergalactic medium with a uh, with magnetic field. So just to end up and come back to the open questions. So I think that now we can provide some answers to this open question have been for several decades. So how did the evolution of galaxies in merger affect magnetic field? So I think that mergers amplify the magnetic field across comic time. So you have an isotropic turbulent fields that dominate the, as the, these small scales at 100 parsec or lower. Is the single reacting medium magnetized and how it got magnetized? So yes, it's magnetized. And what happened here is that magnetic fields are dragged away from the galactic plane by kinematically dominated uh, galactic winds. So what happens is that the starbursts enrich the galactic medium with matter and magnetic field. Uh, we, we also know now that um, star forming regions increase the turbulence at, at small scales, uh, in, in 1068 show a very clear example, and the diffuse and dense ISM may not trace the same uh, uh, magnetic uh, magnetic field. So, in order to understand the three dimensional magnetic field in galaxies, we need to do a multi wavelength uh, parametric observation in radio and far infrared. And uh, generally, uh, we have the turbulence uh, B field dominate the surrounding areas of uh, arctic uh, nuclei. So I think just to um, just to finish, and um, if somebody is uh, interesting, interested uh, in this field, I think it's a many future opportunities here that we still don't know. So one of them is like, what is the relationship between this large scale magnetic field traced by Hawk at the small scale that we are very well used to uh, to see uh, in the Milky Way by Planck. And what happened with this uh, purification mechanism across comic time. So we need simulations in order to do that. And something that need to be done by, uh, with a, a sample of galaxies is not only the orientation, but also the direction of the magnetic field. So the magnetic field going inwards or the magnetic field going outwards uh, in, the, in the galaxy. And if it's many reversals in the st in external galaxy, which is something that the CMB, the common background uh, observations need to, to, to characterize precisely in order to get the primordial B fields in the, in the galaxy, uh, in the universe, I mean. And, and then as I say, just to end up, stay tuned for more results. Uh, the first data release uh, of uh, 15 galaxies will come out at the beginning of next year. So you're gonna have a lot of uh, data to, to play uh, with. So thank you so much for your time. For your time. Um, looking forward for questions and conversation now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Enrique. Uh, so we will take some questions now. Uh, you can raise your hand. I don't know if I can see that, but Andrew and Mitch definitely will. But I will also communicate to Enrique questions put on the on the chat. And uh, Enrique, we have a question uh, from Andrew Hamilton. He's asking, can you make any statement about any cosmologically primordial magnetic field? Uh, no, I cannot make any any statement uh, now. So, and you can see the nearby galaxies. Uh, they're all perturbed by supernova explosions, interaction. Uh, major or minor uh, mergers or star formation regime. So whatever we're seeing uh, is way beyond primordial uh, B fields. I think that in order to do that, um, 
I think sadly we cannot do it with far infrared observations. You need to go to radio observations and study voids or, or intergalactic uh, medium in, in order to get like more clean uh, B fields than that we have now. Uh, Mike, you have your hand raised? Yes, yes, thank you. Lo lovely work. It's just impressive to see how much Hawk has changed this field. Um, I wanted to ask about your, your results on edge-on spirals, because what you're really measuring is uh, only a few kiloparsecs above the disk, not really the intergalactic medium, but the low halo. What can you tell us about, about what might happen out at 50 or 100 kiloparsecs where cosmic rays may be inflating the magnetic field and, uh, and, and pushing it outward? So, okay, that's a good question. So for H on spiral galaxies, uh, we observe two or three of them with far infrared. And as, a, as, uh, as you can see, um, I mean, as we know that there's no dust, <laughs> in the intergalactic uh, medium, except if you have uh, some starburst uh, galaxy that maybe push the, some dust around. So I don't think we can say much about it, uh, but in order to estimate the magnetic field in the halo at a few uh, kiloparseconds, tens of kiloparseconds, you need to study um, yeah, the radio parametric observations. And I think there is a, a study by Krause, uh, K-R-A-S-S-E, uh, last year, that he did a survey of H on galaxies uh, doing uh, using radio parametric observations, and he found a uh, um, underlying X uh, shape uh, magnetic field going up to five to ten kiloparsec uh, scale. I think for ten a hundred kiloparsec or so, uh, it I mean we need low far or SKA or you know, another kind of observations to, to say something about it. For Starburst galaxies, uh, I think uh, we have new observation that didn't show today, uh, but we have observation of uh, M82 and NGC 2146. And they're very deep observations of like five hour observation. The observation that I showed today is 15 minutes. So, uh, and then we have magnetic field, we can measure magnetic field up to 10 kiloparsec. Uh, scales above the, the plane of the galaxy. So at least for M51 and 2146, this galactic outflow are pushing dust uh, up to 10 kiloparsec uh, scales. And then we can, we see that it's following this, um, um, uh, it's basically following the gas uh, outflow uh, for, for Starburst galaxies. So at least for in the intergalactic medium around Starburst galaxies, uh, you have, um, the magnetic field uh, there, but it's basically dominated by the galactic outflow of Starbucks. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mitch. Uh, yeah, what can you say about the uh, relative contribution of supermassive black holes uh, in injecting magnetic energy compared to uh, other stel you know, stellar processes like starbursts? Oh, this is, <laughs> this is a good question. I think we need to talk more about this. So, uh, okay, so, for, we have, I didn't show it here, but we have a, a pilot study of uh, radio low and radio quiet AGN uh, using a uh, hot plus. And what we see is that the radio quiet AGN are unpolarized. Uh, you don't see the signal transmagnetic line that screens for them, but for radio low AGN, they're highly polarized, like a 10% polarization with a magnetic field perpendicular to the radio jet. Uh, at the scales of uh, 50 to 100 per sec. So what you have here is that the magnetic field, the one that we are tracing is the magnetic field in the mid plane of the galaxy. And it's kind of like the interface between the host galaxy and the creation disk. But it's only in radio low AGN. So uh, for radio quiet AGN, we don't see any signature at all of magnetic line the screens in this case. So I think the interaction Yes, it may be some interaction, yeah. but only for the radio low AGN, uh, uh, which I mean, it makes sense. You have a very strong magnetic field um, uh, helping the transfer of angular momentum into the formation of the jet. Uh, but the interesting thing here is that 
this magnetic field is not only in the creation disk, but also extend to tens of parsec in the disk of the galaxy, uh, at least. Yeah. Uh, ben. Yeah, uh, great talk. Um, I just have a quick question about, um, you know, extending this to high redshift um, to the peak of cosmic star formation. Yes, uh, that's a good question. So it's like, it's a, a graduate student in ISO uh, in Germany who has a, a ALMA a approved ALMA observation to study the magnetic field in Starburst galaxy uh, redshift of two, I think uh, three or four. So, so, um, so he has a simulations uh, using uh, our MT2 observations. Uh, and then what he did was a, uh, uh, do, do, doing a, um, a ray tracing of a lens uh, galaxy and try to estimate uh, what is the expected uh, magnetic field uh, orientation uh, in order to explain the observations of, uh, of ALMA. So I think that uh, ALMA can do a lot, but it's highly underexplored. If nobody, nobody except one or two people maybe doing, doing this. And I think the high redshift tracing does continue uh, I mean, the metric field of the task continuing, I think it's a lot of things to, to, be, to be done. Uh, at least at redshift two or three, I think it can be easily, easily done. And I think this uh, grad student ESO is, I think it's pioneering this, uh, this field. But I don't have um, observations now to tell you uh, uh, what, what, I mean, what we are getting from, from it, but I think uh, it's, uh, it's a potential field that can be, that can be done. Thanks. Yeah. Daniel. Yeah, a very interesting talk. Um, again, maybe a couple of hypotheticals bringing this down much closer to um, our neighborhood. If you had a suitable far IR uh, polarimeter and you had enough dust in the interplanetary medium, could you really use this technique to look at the um, changing interplanetary magnetic field orientation? I'm basically wondering about whether the ambient dust in our uh, in the interplanetary medium could be used as sort of a a tool to get a handle on the interplanetary magnetic field orientation. Um, well, that's a that's a good question. So, like, you mean the 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 dust in the in the interplanetary? Uh, right. Oof. So what I'm envisioning I'm, I'm is that there's it. dust there and that the polarimetry could really maybe be used to, uh, to actually see, you know, the changing magnetic field orientation in our own neighborhood. Maybe, I don't know how much dust is in, is in our interplanetary. Uh, yeah, um, well, I'm going to talk to my dust friends here <laughs> about this, but, uh, but in principle, it seems like this could be an interesting um, technique to, uh, yeah, so get a handle on transient magnetic fields. Yeah, yeah, it will be interesting. I don't know, I don't know how much dust is there and how much bright will be and how sensitive you need this uh, this observatory to to be. Yeah, uh, to, to get at that, that's that's interesting. I think, I mean, I know from the planetary, these uh, people do do this kind of things with Alma all the time, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but in our solar system, um, I'm not familiar with them. I, yeah. won't, I won't be able to, to say anything about it. Anyway, it stimulated some interesting thoughts. Yeah. So uh, I'll do some checking. Thanks for the very interesting talk. Thanks. Huh. Interesting. Uh, any, any other questions? Uh, again, feel free to raise your hand or put your question on the chat. I'll give uh, maybe a, an extra minute. Or uh, an extra few seconds. Well, if that's, that's the case, uh, let's uh, thank Enrique uh, again uh, for a wonderful talk and, and you know, wanted to share his afternoon with, with us today. Uh, he, he was not able to travel here in the end, uh, and, but hopefully he'll be able to, to visit in the, in the near future. So thank you, thank you all for attending and, and thank you Enrique again for sharing your time with us. Thanks a lot. Great thank talk. you so much. Thanks. Thank you.